people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Lipakshi Kurana with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Celebrated for efficiency and reliability, the Indian Space Research Organization is carving an indomitable path in space exploration. Recent milestones, including a successful lunar mission, have garnered global attention. With a reputation for cost-effective launches and collaborative initiatives, ISRO is setting a high bar for space agencies worldwide. Join us as we discuss how India's space agency is growing bigger by the day and how it stands poised to reach the top in times to come. The Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, is rapidly emerging as a powerhouse in the realm of space exploration and is being lauded for its consistency, efficiency and the cost effectiveness. With each successful mission, ISRO cements its reputation as a reliable global player attracting the attention of international partners seeking economical and dependable space launch solutions. In a remarkable feat that unfolded last month on July 14th, ISRO orchestrated the launch of a rocket that seamlessly deployed a spacecraft into orbit, positioning it for an audacious lunar landing scheduled this month. Approximately 16 minutes later, ISRO's mission control resounded with triumph announcements as the Chandrayaan-3 lander was confirmed to have been expertly positioned into Earth's orbit. This intricate maneuver paves the way for an extraordinary endeavor, an impending lunar landing attempt at the South Pole. If successful, this milestone will not only mark India's ascension as a major space power, but will also underscore its technological prowess and strategic vision. Should the Chandrayaan-3 mission achieve its objectives, India will join an elite consortium of nations, including the United States, the former Soviet Union and China, that have executed controlled lunar landings. It's a moment of glory for all of us. It's a moment of glory for India. And I think a moment of destiny for all of us, that we are part of the history in making. And I must uh, thank Team Isro for making India proud. What makes this mission particularly remarkable is its focus on landing at the lunar south pole, an area replete with water ice resources that have the potential to revolutionize future space exploration, including establishing a space station. ISRO's accomplishments go beyond lunar ambitions. In another remarkable feat, ISRO launched a cluster of seven satellites, prominently featuring the primary DSSAR satellite and six co-passenger Singapore satellites. DSLV C-56 carrying seven satellites, including the primary satellite DSR and six co-passengers have been successfully placed in the right orbit. This is a mission of the PSLV for NSIL and I want to congratulate the customers sponsored by Government of Singapore for having this mission on board PSLV and their continued faith in our PSLV for deploying the spacecrafts from Singapore. India's prowess in satellite manufacturing and its adeptness at executing low-cost launches has positioned it as a formidable contender in the global space arena. In addition to its technical feats, ISRO is fostering an ecosystem of collaboration. Collaborative projects encompass the United Nations, BRICS nations, Israel, NASA and the European Space Agency, demonstrating India's indomitable space spirit and its commitment to broadening the horizons of cosmic exploration. Experts in the field express confidence that success in lunar exploration is not a distant dream, but an imminent reality for India. This feeling, 
reflects the resolute commitment and boundless possibilities that define India's voyage among the stars. Moving on, Sri Lanka is actively seeking foreign investments to bolster its economy recovery efforts. Last week, a high-level Japanese delegation led by Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi visited the island nation in response to its call for investment in critical sectors such as power, infrastructure and dedicated investment zones. India has also played a vital role by providing significant financial aid to assist Sri Lanka's emergence from the crisis. Now, stepping in to lend a helping hand, French President Emmanuel Macron recently made a brief overnight stopover in Sri Lanka, signaling France's commitment to supporting the country's recovery. These efforts from India, Japan and France have further instilled a sense of confidence in the island nation's journey towards stability and growth. A high-level Japanese delegation visited Sri Lanka last week, responding to the island nation's call for foreign investment to aid its economic recovery in the aftermath of a severe financial crisis. The visit also marked a significant step in rebuilding historically vibrant relations between the two countries. Sri Lanka's President Ranil Vikrame Singhe urged Japan to make substantial investments during the delegation's visit. The invitation included proposals for projects in crucial sectors such as power, roads and ports. Sri Lanka is also seeking Japanese investment in dedicated zones for businesses as well as energy and digital sector. The country's Foreign Minister Ali Sabri highlighted the importance of collaboration and economic cooperation with Japan to bolster their economy and infrastructure. Japan is a trusted partner and with clear indicators of Sri Lanka's gradual economic recovery, both the President and I invited Japan to receive the Japanese investment project which are currently in the pipeline and invested in, invited fresh investment from Japan in several sectors such as power, infrastructure, including port and highway sectors, dedicated investment zones, as well as the green and digital economy. While the Japanese Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi did not respond publicly to the investment invitation during his visit to Colombo, he expressed Japan's interest in cooperating with the Indian Ocean Rim Association, which Sri Lanka is set to chair from October. Sri Lanka is located up at strategic juncture along the sea lanes of Indian Ocean and is an important partner in realizing a free and open Indo-Pacific or FOIP. At today's meeting, I explained about the new plan for the FOIP that Prime Minister Kishida announced in March this year and stated that Japan attaches importance to cooperation with the Indian Ocean Limb Association, or IOLA, which Sri Lanka will chair from October. Sri Lanka's recovery efforts have also received support from the other countries and international lenders. India played a crucial role in assisting the island nation with a significant financial aid package worth 4 billion US dollars. Additionally, the global lender International Monetary Fund provided Sri Lanka with a 3 billion US dollar loan to help stabilize its economy. In another positive development, French President Emmanuel Macron also made a brief overnight stopover in Sri Lanka. During his visit, he met with President Vikram Singhe and discussed shared regional and global challenges. The leaders also explored a debt restructuring strategy involving both countries. As Sri Lanka emerges from its economic crisis, the engagement of countries like Japan, India and France signifies the international community's willingness to support the island nation's recovery efforts. These collaborations are expected to pave the way for stronger economic ties and sustainable development in the region. Led by India, Sri Lanka is slowly but steadily finding its way out of the crisis 
receiving critical assistance from various nations and international bodies. Moving on, massive protests engulfed Dhaka over the weekend as tens of thousands of demonstrators voiced their demands for the resignation of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and the formation of a caretaker government ahead of the upcoming 2024 elections. The rallies led by supporters of the opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party, BNP, highlighted concerns over the government's handling of rising living costs, fuel prices and allegations of electoral improprieties. The confrontations between protesters and the law enforcement turned violent, resulting in injuries, damage to public property and dozens of arrests. Massive protests erupted in Dhaka last weekend, with tens of thousands demanding Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's resignation and the formation of a caretaker government before the January 2024 elections. Supporters of the opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party expressed frustration over what they called government's inability to control living costs and fuel prices, while also voicing concerns about the suppression of dissent and alleged election irregularities. The protests turned violent, with clashes between the demonstrators and law enforcement resulting in injuries and property damage. A police vehicle and three public buses were set on fire and several private cars were vandalized during the demonstrations. কারণ যেভাবে দেশ চালাচ্ছে এভাবে এভাবে দেশ চালায় না এই জন্যই আরসি আমরা এখানে নিজের ভোট নিজে দেওয়ার জন্য আজ পর্যন্ত কখনো আমাদের ভোট আমরা দিতে পারি নাই আমাদের এখানে আসার কারণ আমরা ভোট অধিকার ফিরে পেতে চাই আমরা ভোট দিতে চাই আমরা তরুণ প্রজন্ম আমরা তরুণ প্রজন্ম নিজের ভোট নিজে দিতে চাই The police reported that around two dozen officers were injured in the confrontations. However, the BNP alleged that dozens of its supporters were also injured amidst the conflict with law enforcement. According to reports, the Dhaka Metropolitan Police arrested over 90 opposition supporters, but BNP leaders claimed the number exceeded 1,000. The BNP accused the current government of being autocratic and cracking down on anti-government protests using undemocratic means to maintain its grip on power. This allegation is not new as similar incidents occurred in the past, including the arrest of top BNP leaders last December ahead of another large rally demanding Sheikh Hasina's resignation. The situation garnered international attention with 13 envoys, including those from the US, UK, Canada, Germany and Denmark, issuing a joint statement urging for peaceful and fair elections. The Bangladesh Foreign Ministry responded, condemning the statement by foreign powers and asserting the government's commitment to democracy. However, mounting Western criticism continues to raise concerns about the state of democracy in Bangladesh. In May, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned of potential visa restrictions for those undermining the voting process. We are concerned about the reports of intimidation and political violence in Bangladesh surrounding this weekend's political protests. We encourage the government of Bangladesh uh, uh, to investigate reports of violence, violence thoroughly, transparently and impartially, and to hold the perpetrators of violence to account. We urge Bangladesh to create a safe environment for people to peacefully assemble and voice their concerns. And we call on all parties uh, to respect fundamental freedoms and the rule of law and to refrain from violence, harassment and intimidation. And I will say finally that free and fair elections depend on the commitment of everyone, voters, political parties, youth wings and police and cannot take place in an, in an environment with political violence. The country has experienced accusations of vote rigging and opposition targeting in past elections, 
further fueling tensions in the political landscape. As the nation approaches the upcoming elections, the demand for transparency, fairness and adherence to democratic principles intensifies. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Thailand's Pew Thai Party will nominate real estate tycoon Sreta Thavisin for the next prime ministerial vote in parliament amid a prolonged political deadlock after a May 14 general election. Thailand's election-winning Move Forward Party is no longer part of an eight-party alliance that was formed after a May general election in an attempt to form the country's next government. Move Forward emerged as the largest party in the May polls, followed by Pew Thai. Pew Thai party leader Chunlanan Sri Khao told a news conference in Bangkok his party had little choice but to break with its ally in the face of insurmountable conservative opposition to it. The latest move by Pew Thai party also upset some protesters gathering in front of the party headquarters saying they were disappointed by the move. <laughs> ขอยืนยันชัดเจนว่าเราจะไม่สนับสนุนการแก้ไขมาตรา 106 และdespite a crippling heat wave and mounting heat exhaustion related cases among event participants. At least 600 people at the World Scout Jamuri, which kicked off on 1st of August, have so far been treated for heat related ailments. On Friday morning, Scout members were seen walking around their tents and washing their feet to cool off. The event coincides with the highest level of heat warning by the government in four years as temperatures in some parts of the country exceeded 38 degrees Celsius. U.S. passport holders with Palestinian papers and families in Gaza are urging Washington to ensure they are treated equally under a reciprocal deal with Israel intended to ensure visa-free travel for American and Israeli citizens. Israel facing a September 30 deadline to qualify its citizens for visa-free admission to the U.S. said it has loosened access through its main airport and at the occupied West Bank's boundary for Palestinian Americans, allowing more than 2,000 people to cross into or through Israel. U.S. State Department officials have said the visa waiver program must apply to all American citizens, including those in Gaza, but a number of Palestinian Americans with Gaza identity papers have said that they have been prevented from entering Israel. The severe restrictions imposed by the Israel on Palestinians have made qualification for the visa waiver a test for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government, which must show it treats all U.S. passport holders exactly the same, regardless of any other nationality they may hold. Thousands of worshippers last week marked Ashura at the shrine of Imam Hussein, the Prophet Muhammad's grandson in Iraq's holy city of Karbala. Worshippers typically bang their chest and chant while flogging themselves with knives and swords in mourning for Imam Hussein. The Prophet Muhammad's grandson died in the Battle of Karbala in 680 AD. The battle cemented a schism in Islam between Shiites and Sunnis. The entire riot lasts more than a week and sees its culmination on Ashura, the 10th day of the Muslim month of Muharram, which marks the moment Hussein was killed and beheaded by his enemies in Karbala.
Moving on, India has always been blessed with a rich cultural and natural heritage and is often admired for its divinity. The diverse ethnicity and its flourishing multiculturalism are the reflections of India's age-old civilization. Make Malhar 2023 the ninth edition of the month-long annual monsoon festival in the Dang district of Gujarat is booing tourists with its uniqueness. Today in our show, we'll take you through Gujarat's Saputara Hill Station, which has created a buzz among the folks for its photogenic scenic beauty. The scenic landscape of Gujarat's hilly town of Saputara hosted a stunning display of state's cultural heritage, the annual monsoon festival, Make Malhar 2023. A large number of artists in traditional attire, singing choirs and captivating folk dances led a parade to celebrate the beginning of the rainy season. The festival attracted people from all corners of the country as well as locals who gathered to witness this culturally rich extravaganza. Make Malhar is an initiative by the Gujarat government to promote Saputara as a tourist destination and showcase the wonders of the region to the world. Now, in its ninth edition, the Monsoon Festival offers a wide range of adventures, exhibitions, cultural performances, food festivals, interactive games and fun competitions. First time in India and the uh, Monsoon Festival is uh, also I'm attending for the first time. Uh, we are ICCR students and we are here for this festival. It's a new experience for me. Uh, I like Indian culture and Indian dance. Uh, it's my pleasure to attend for this festival. Uh, I can little dance Garba because we are studies in Gujarat University and they are playing Garba like every festival and uh, little it like you know. The captivating hill station of Dang becomes a major tourist attraction during the monsoon season, drawing in thousands of visitors each year for the month-long festival. Tourists become an integral part of the cultural march, joining in with dancing and singing alongside traditional performers. The atmosphere is very beautiful. मॉनसून सीजन में अगर यहाँ पे आप आएंगे तो बहुत अच्छा लगेगा आपको और ये यही एक ऐसा एटमॉस्फेयर है यहाँ पे देखो आप देख सकते हो कि फॉग भी कितना अच्छा है और यहाँ यहाँ का मौसम भी बहुत अच्छा है तो हम लोग तो बहुत एंजॉय कर रहे हैं the tourist attraction of Dang also brings economic opportunities for the tribes residing in the areas for ages. As tourist footfall witnesses a spike in Gujarat, small businesses run by tribal people are anticipating a boost in their income. Today, the July monsoon festival started from 30 July. The atmosphere of atmosphere is very big and the tourists have also increased. There is also an overloaded crowd. जो सटरडे संडे जो पहले जो होता था उससे इस टाइम ज्यादा है मॉनसून फेस्टिवल की वजह से। All those who participate in such events leave with a sense of contentment and are enriched with cultural knowledge about diverse India. The monsoon festival of Gujarat is just a glimpse of India's rich natural heritage. However. There are many such wonders which are yet to be discovered. There are a number of such events held every year that truly highlight the heritage and culture of India's diversity. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.